announcements. So I know on the schedule, um, today it said uh, Jen was supposed to come in. So unfortunately, her, her mother passed away a week ago. So she, she, I think she'll probably still come next week. We're not sure yet. But um, so I'm going to give today's talk, and she'll probably come in sometime next week. Um, OK, a few other things. Um, so I had a request to have a day on the weekend when the tournaments would be earlier in the day. Um, would there be anyone who would be opposed, who would be seriously opposed to this weekend, me moving all the tournaments to say, let's say, start five hours or six hours earlier? So we would, so the, the daily six-handed would start at 12 o'clock noon, and the daily, um, and the hyper -tur turbo would start at 5 p.m. Would, would anyone be seriously opposed to doing this for, for the weekend, maybe? Like not, for, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So someone's saying, "How about just Saturday?" Someone's saying, "Move half of them earlier." I also had a request a while ago to have one or two more tournaments. So I could also, so maybe I don't want to have too many more tournaments, but maybe I'll do something like I'll, I'll I'll have seven tournaments for both Saturday and Sunday this weekend, and I'll make them start every two hours, starting at say noon. How does that sound? So they'll start at twelve, two, four, six, eight, ten, or Maybe just six or something, or five. OK, so that's going to happen this weekend. Um, so the tournament schedule is going to change a bit just for this weekend, um, just to accommodate those who don't want to stay up late until 11 o'clock to wait for the hyper turbo to start. So OK. Um, the other thing is, so I'm going to get the attendance trackers to write their names and where they're sitting down here. So hopefully, it's easier to find the attendance trackers. Um, is, is, is Steve, are you the last one? Who, who's the one for the last part of the alphabet? I oh, OK, OK. Um, it's OK. Just, just do it at the break or something. Yeah, thanks, buddy. OK, good. Um, OK, so, so let's get started. OK, so I want to talk, um, so talk about a few things that I think, um, we, that I, think I haven't really addressed uh, yet in the class that I think will help players a lot um, for, for the tournaments based on what I've been watching. So, OK, so here I want to do a quick review of expectation and equity. So the first 10, 15 minutes might go a bit slow for those of you who are really quick at this, but I want to make sure everybody understands what expectation and equity means. OK, so we'll start with an example, and then we'll see how to apply expectation and equity to it. So the situation is this. It's folded to you in the small blind, and everybody has 15 big blinds. And so the question is, um, let's say you have to go all in or you have to fold. Um, the question is, should you go all in or should you fold? OK, and to figure out whether you should go all in or, or whether you should fold, you need, to do an, you need to do an expectation calculation, basically. You, what you're trying to do is you're calculating the expectation of going all in and seeing if it's positive. So the expectation from folding, you, we always consider to be 0. Um, so that's usually the start. So you know, you could say the expectation of folding is minus 400 because we posted the small blind of 400. You can do the math like that and it'll still work, but I think it's harder. It's usually customary and easier to just um, assume that the 400 small blind you posted is not, is not your money anymore. It's, you've already lost it. And when you're doing the expectation calculation, do start at zero. So we assume that the equity of folding, sorry, the expectation of folding is zero, and we want to calculate whether the expectation of going all in is more than zero. And if it's more than zero, then it's a good play. And if it's less than zero, then it's a bad play. OK. Um, so okay. So obviously, it depends. it depends on what you think he's going to call you with, right? If you know that he's going to fold all the time, then you can just go all in and pick up the pot for free. So it depends on what, you're gonna call, what he's going to call you with, right? So it obviously depends on a few things. It depends on whether he's a gambling player. Is it likely that he or she will call with the right wide range of hands? And obviously, it depends on how, how much credibility you think you'll have. Like, do, do you look like a crazy player? So there's a couple of exter extraneous factors. But I'm going to mostly ignore those for now when I do the calculation. So OK, let's assume he calls something like um, this range, OK? Um, so. I mean, so th this, is just a, this is just an assumption. I'm not saying everybody is going to call this range. I'm not saying this is the range he should be calling. This is an assumption. But I want to make an assumption so that we can do the calculation. 
Okay, so let's just suppose he calls 25% of, of hands. And I think this is about reasonable, right? This doesn't seem too crazy. Does this seem too crazy to anyone? Is there, a, is there someone who would call with a hand much worse than this or fold a hand that's highlighted in yellow? It's okay, it's okay if you would, because uh, um, I'm not saying at all this is the best range to call with. But let's just suppose he calls with this range, which is 25% of hands, okay? So to calculate whether going all in is a positive expectation decision, what we need to do is we need to calculate our equity against this range, okay? So, um, so once again, I'm gonna go a bit slowly to make sure everybody gets this, right? So we plug this into Poker Stove, okay? And Poker Stove tells us so you see down here in the bottom right, this is poker stove, and we gave ourselves 10-8 offsuit, and we gave him this range up here. And we said, what's the probability that we win against this range, assuming that neither player folds and all five cards come out? Okay, is this equity concept very clear? Right, so it's, uh, um, it's just, it's, it's a, it's, it tells us the chances that we win, um, and it's, and it, it gives him a hand in this range proportional to the probability that he has that hand. And it looks at all the possibility of the five cards coming out and looks at the probability that you win. Okay, and for those of you who are picky, this does discount the fact that you have a 10 and an eight in your hand. So when it, when it assigns, when it calculates the probability that he has each of those hands, it's gonna give pocket 10s and pocket eights a lower probability because you have a 10. Um, so it does take that into account. Okay. Um, okay, so then the calculation. So I want everyone to understand this calculation. If you do it, so, because um, so I had a question about this, and um, so I want to make sure that everyone understands this calculation. So feel free to stop. So I'm, I'm mostly addressing this because I got a question about this and that there was confusion about, for some of you, about this calculation. So I want to make sure everyone understands this calculation. So 75% of the time, he folds and we win two and a half big blinds, okay? We win the big blind, the sum of the antes, and the small blind, okay? And then 25% of the time he calls and conditioned on that, 36% of the time, we win the all in and we win 16 and a half big blinds, right? Because now we win his entire stack, which is 15 big blinds, plus the antes, which is one big blind, plus the small blind, which is um, 0 0.5 big blinds. And 65% of the time, sorry, 64% of the time, we lose the all-in and we lose our entire stack, our entire remaining stack, which is 14 and a half big blinds. Okay, so the calculation is 0.75 times plus 2.5, okay, plus 0.25, and then you open the brackets and it's 0.36 times plus 16.5 plus 0.64 times minus 14.5. Okay, so, uh, Please ask me if, so does this calculation make sense? So this is, this is the calculation of your expectation from going all in, right? Okay, good, okay, so, okay, so yeah, please ask me if there's, there's no shame if you don't, because I don't expect everyone to come from a math background, so. Um, okay, good, so okay, yeah, so I wanted to clear this up, good. So if you, if you plug this into your calculator, um, this thing inside the brackets becomes minus 3.34. So essentially what this says is, when he calls you, you lose 3.34 big blinds on average. So 75% of the time, we win two and a half big blinds, and 25% of the time, we lose 3.34 big blinds. So on average, we're obviously making money. So it's 1.04 big blinds. So, so it turns out that if he's only, uh, yeah, question? Right, okay, so okay, that's a good question. So uh, the question was the, the variance could be very high even though the expectation is high. So that is true. So I mean, if it gets later on in the, in the tournament, you wanna be playing with slightly less risk. But um, just in general, plus one big blind is a huge, is a huge amount. And um, assuming, I mean, this is only relevant basically at the final table, the stuff about minimizing variance. Because at any time before the final table, um, the payouts are basically all at the final table. And if you're not gonna pick up spots where you're making one big blind for your decision, then um, you're not gonna make the final table, basically. You're just gonna get eaten up by the blinds. So, um, so, so just, at, I guess, as a rule of thumb to remember, plus one big blind is a huge plus positive EV decision. If it's like 
plus 0 0.05 big blinds, then folding to minimize variance seems okay. But even like plus a third of a big blind is, is, a, is huge, is a ton. Yeah, um, good question. Yeah, so yeah, so earlier I think I said, suppose it's far from the final table under here, but um, I was sneaky, I put it in brackets. Okay, um, so, okay, so let's do this calculation again where we have the worst hand possible. Okay, let's do this calculation again where we have three, two offsuit. Okay, so the only difference is now we only have 28% equity instead of 36% equity against this calling range. Okay, so now the calculation is the same except when he calls us, instead of losing 3.34 big blinds, we're losing 5.82 big blinds. We're losing a lot more when he calls us. But still, if you look at this overall expectation, 75% of the time we win two and a half big blinds and 25% of the time we lose 5.8 big blinds. That's still positive. It's still a play that earns you 0.42 big blinds. It's still a good play. So it seems kind of crazy to go all in here with 15 big blinds with the worst hand possible. I mean, maybe like 7-2 offsuit is slightly worse in some cases, but um, this is about as bad as it gets. And we're still making 0.42 big blinds, assuming the big blind strategy is to only call the top 25% of hands. Okay, so what does this tell you? This tells you that if the big blind strategy is only calling 25% of hands, then this allows the small blind to shove any two cards profitably from the small blind, which seems kind of crazy, but you know, even with the worst hand, he's making, he's making 0 0.42 big blinds. It's not even like it's a marginally plus EV shove. It's a hugely plus EV shove, even with the worst possible hand. So, um, okay, so, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Okay, so now let's suppose, okay, the big blind says, um, okay, we're, we're going to add queen jack off to our calling range. So originally we didn't have queen jack off in our calling range. Um, so so let's, go th let's put ourselves in the big blind's shoes now. Let's figure out what hands we should be calling with. Okay, so it's a similar equity calculation. The calculation he does is he needs to win, he needs to call 14 big blinds to win a total pot of 31 big blinds. So he needs 45% equity. So he calculates his equity with queen jack against your, your perceived shoving range. Let's say he thinks you're tight. He thinks you're only shoving top 25% of hands. He runs the calculation. He only has 42% equity, which means queen jack off is a fold. Okay, so, um, so the, the point I'm trying to get at is what he calls with depends on what he thinks you shove with. And what you shove with depends on what you think he calls with. So it's sort of like a he, th it's sort of like a he knows that I know that, he knows that I know that, that type of game, right? It depends on what he knows that you know and what you know that he, that he knows. So, okay, so now I wanna, I wanna take a look at the Nash ranges. Okay, so Bill Chen mentioned this in his lecture, right? So whether the small blind, how much the small blind shoves and how much the big blind calls, this is a he knows that I know that, he knows that I know game. Um, if the big blind folds a lot, if he only calls a small percent, I'm shoving any two cards. Right, but if he knows that I'm shoving any two cards, then he can call a lot. And then if I know that he's gonna call a lot, then I'm gonna not shove any two cards. I'm gonna shove only good hands, right? And the idea with this Nash equilibrium thing is if you go on, this basically converges at some kind of equilibrium, okay? And on Friday's class by Bill Chen, we sort of looked at how to calculate these equilibria. And if you do the calculation for this, you need a computer to do it, but if you do it, the Nash ranges is this. The small blind, the correct strategy for the small blind is to shove 66.8% of hands with 15 big blinds. And the correct strategy for the big blind is to call 38.5% of hands, okay? So of course, this shouldn't be the formula you follow at the actual poker table, but this is the theoretical solution, which means even, so, right, so, so if the big blind, um, yeah, so if the big blind is calling way fewer than 38.5% of hands, then you should be shoving as the small blind more than 66.8% of hands. And if the small blind isn't shoving anywhere near 66.8% of hands, then as the big blind, it's a huge mistake to call with as much as 38.5% of hands. Right, so that's the same equilibrium. So the point is, why is it an equilibrium? 
the equi it's an equilibrium because if the small blind is going all in with 66.8% of hands, then the optimal strategy for the b big blind is to call 38.5% of hands and vice versa. So basically these equilibria you don't want to follow, but it's good to know what the equilibrium is so that if your opponent is tighter than average, you know to err on this side of the equilibrium. And if your opponent is looser than average, you know to err on the other side of the equilibrium. Okay, so does everyone understand um, what equilibrium means and why you don't want to follow it, but how you want to adjust to one side of the equilibrium based on whether your opponent is tight or loose, right? So if your opponent is tight and folds a lot, then you can be more adventurous and you can shove more than the equilibrium. If your opponent is loose and calls a lot, then you need to be careful and shove less than the equilibrium. Uh, yeah. Um, that's a very good question. Um, the, so in this specific case, um, the, the big blind has the advantage. Does it change the way you change the sack size? If you change, yeah, so if you change the sack size, so, th I, I, so this is a tr trivia fact I happen to know, but in general this is not solved. But for a small blind versus big blind, um, w without antes, it's eight, so with antes maybe like 11. If it's, if it's 11, it's about a break-even game. If it's about 11, it's like a break-even game. And here it favors the big blind. I mean, but we're assuming the small blind can't raise small, right? We're assuming the small blind has to shove or fold. Um, so yeah, and this, assuming the small blind has to shove or fold, it's a break even game at about, at about 11. May, maybe a bit less, 10. I know it's eight when there's no antes. So with the antes, it's maybe like, yeah, it's, it's a bit more in favor of the small blind. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, so just to give you a sense, here's a few more Nash ranges to shove. I don't have all the calling ranges because there's multiple players you can call. But um, a few more Nash ranges. If you're on the button and it's folded to you and you have 10 big blinds, shove about 44%. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's, so it's good to get a, get a sense of this, right? So, you know, so if it's folded to you on the button and the effective stack size is 10 big blinds and you, you look at the small blind and big blind, if they're really tight, if you think they're really scared players, then you can shove even more than this. And if you think they're crazy loose who are going to call you very wide and like gambling, then you should probably not shove the weak hands in here like 5-4 suited. But this is the equilibrium range, right? So it's, it's very useful to know because you know which side to err on. Okay, cut off seven big blinds, shove about 38.8%. Um, yeah, and the other point was, yeah, there was so as it gets closer and closer to the final table, you want to be a bit more risk averse and you want to shove slightly less than these percentages as it gets to the final two tables and final table. But at the, w but at the beginning, definitely, these are the, these are the theoretical solutions. Okay, low jack, 10 big blinds, right? So all these are assuming everyone in front of you folded. Um, I uh, was hoping, I was assuming that's um, obvious. So all of these are assuming everyone in front of you folded. Um, so I'll put these slides on the website so don't, you don't have to copy all this down. But I just wanted to show you a few few examples. So the last one's kind of interesting. The last one, you're under the gun nine-handed, and there's only th you only have three big blinds. So the next hand, you're pretty much forced all in because you're going to post the big blind. But you still only shove 24.1% of hands. So, so this, uh, but this is assuming you know the other people will know to call your three big blinds very with a very weak hand because they have the odds to. Right, right, yeah, so yeah, so these, yeah, right, so the hand ranges are, yeah, so the, the hand ranges are somewhat arbitrary. The hand ranges are not precise for the situation, that's true. Um, but the numbers are precise according to a computer, yeah. Okay, good. So, okay, so let's talk a bit about, suppose I'm too scared to go all in. Can I raise the just two big blinds as an alternative, right? So I see this a lot. So, so in this situation, um, the, the button only has eight big blinds, but instead of choosing to go all in for eight big blinds, they choose to raise it to 400, right? So let's look at what happens if you raise it to 400 instead of going all in. So let's put ourselves in big blinds shoes, okay? So, so okay, let's say the big blind looks at this card and gets uh, ace-king, or a good hand, a really good hand, right, ace-king. So he's gonna think, okay, if I go all in, the button only needs to call six to win a pot of 17.5. Uh, so, so he needs to call six because he already put in two of his eight big blinds. So he needs to call six, and if he calls, the pot will be 
8 plus 8 plus 1 plus 0.5, so it'll be 17.5. So they're going to call as long as they think they have 34% equity against our range. So basically, they'll pretty much always call um, when they put in two big blinds. They, they're basically committed to call. Um, so when we go all in, so when we go all in, assuming they call, we risk seven to win the pot of 17.5. So we need 40% equity for going all in to be profitable. Okay. So, okay, so, so the analysis as the, the big blind is as follows. If our hand has 40% equity versus the button's range, then going all in is positive EV. Now, if our hand doesn't have 40% equity against the button's range, calling could still be plus EV. And that's, so why is that? Okay, so let's say our hand is 4-3 suited, which is exactly what I, what I gave, in, gave you in this case. If we call, what are our odds to see the flop? Right? If, if we call, our odds to see the flop are actually basically four and a half to one, which is really, really good. Right? So of course, if we just call, we can't go by the equity calculation to be precise because, right, because we still have to play post-flop. We still have to make decisions post-flop. So there's such things as reverse implied odds and all this other stuff that we talked about in, in an earlier lecture. So it's not, so we, it's not exactly four and a half to one odds. It's worse because we're out of position, but still, it's not gonna be that much worse. And we can definitely call with four three suited, even though it's a hand that doesn't have 40% equity against the button's range. Okay, so they can, so they're gonna, they can go all in with the hands that have 40% equity. They can call with some hands that don't have 40% equity. And they, they can also make some other decisions, like even if their hand has 40% equity, they might choose to not go all in. They might choose to call because it's more plus EV. So often you have two plus EV plays, right? So, so even if you know sh going all in is plus EV, that doesn't necessarily mean you just go all in because there might be a more plus EV play. Okay, so let's suppose his strategy, it, I mean, it, this, the details don't really matter. Um, so the strategy I, I outlined is if he has more than 50% equity, then he's gonna go all in because it's favorable for him to put in money one to one with the button. If he has less than 50% equity, then it's likely in his interest to just call even though he's out of position because he doesn't wanna put all the money in one for one. Um, I mean, the details of this aren't ma don't matter and I'm not saying this is precisely the best strategy, but the point is you, you, give, you give him a lot more decisions. You give him a lot more um, choices to, to make when you don't go all in. So you just give him a lot more opportunities to squeeze out extra, even more positive expectation decisions. So the big lesson is none of these opportunities for the big blind would have arisen had the button just went all in in the first place. Okay, if he just went all in, his strategy is simple. He has to, he calls if he has 40% equity and folds everything else. But now you're allowing him to play more hands even when he doesn't have 40% equity, he can see the flop and play the flop and he can make good, he can just, he just has more decisions and he has more power to choose the best action. So, okay, so here's another common one that I think people like. Okay, instead of going all in, I'll raise to 800. I'll raise half my stack pre-flop. So, okay, so we can quickly analyze this. So if the big blind was gonna fold, then it's, then it's the same thing, right? It's equivalent to going all in. If the big blind is gonna re-raise all in himself, then we're gonna call, so that's also equivalent. Other situations where the big blind is better off calling and folding some flops? Probably not, since the, since the pot will be 1880 if he calls, and each player is only gonna have 800 left, so the, so the big blind calls, so no one's gonna fold post-flop if he calls, so it's basically equivalent to all in pre-flop. So the conclusion is basically raising to 4x is basically equivalent to going all in. Um, so, you know, instead of going all in, if you want for fun, you could raise it to 800 instead of going all in. Um, maybe to deceive your opponent, maybe he won't notice that you have $800 left or something, I don't know. Uh, so, so, but the point is, you, so Bill Chen also talked about this. So the, the, the point is, you know, going all in just gives your opponent the smallest number of decisions. Right? If you don't go on, if you raise the 2x or 3x or 4x, you're giving them strictly more options than before. So, you know, so for, for, for not going on to be a better play than going all in, the big blind has to be so stupid that having more options will somehow cause them to make a worse decision, right? So if you're not going all in, essentially what you're saying is the big blind is so stupid that 
giving him more decisions will cause him to make a worse decision. Um, sorry, giving him more options will cause him to work amaz make a worse decision, right? So this is what Bill Chen was talking about. He gave an example where the small blind could just say, the pot's mine and take the pot, or the small blind could bet and give the big blind a chance to not fold. And so it's sort of like a sucker bet. Basically, you only do this if you think they're really stupid. So um, I hope no one in this class is this stupid. So basically, I mean, I would be offended if the button did this to you because th what they're saying is they think giving you more options will cause you to make a worse decision against them. So this is why just in general going all in is just um, best, at least at a high level, when no one is going to make a worse decision when presented with more options. So that's sort of the theory of why. It's not even about being scared or being, being um, a wuss about going on. It's just, um, it's just theoretically the correct play because you don't want to give them more options than you need to. Okay, so we just reviewed how to do an expectation equity calculation. We explained why going all in is so profitable when everyone in front of you has folded and you're risking less than 15 big blinds. We explained why raising to 2.25 big blinds or two big blinds or whatever as a cowardly alternative when the above two factors are present is nowhere near as profitable because you give them more options and you allow them to play a larger percent of hands instead of just taking down the pot. Okay, so okay, so I wanted to do a review of a bunch of things. So a lot of that I think might have been review for some of you, but I wanted to emphasize again and again, make sure you know how to do the equity calculation and make sure that you don't fold preflop when you have two good odds to call preflop. Okay. So the next thing I want to do is I want to do a very in-depth combinatorial analysis of a hand. Ah, uh, yeah, sorry, question. Yeah. 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 Okay, very good question. Yeah, I should have mentioned this. Very good question. The question was, you know, what if you have aces? Should I still go all in? Should I, um, or should I just raise small to give them a chance to play more? So the answer is, the answer is, it is better in a vacuum to raise small so that they can play more hands. It is better to not go all in with aces. But the problem is, if this is your usual strategy, then people will know that you always have aces when you raise small. So. If you want to adopt the strategy for your entire poker career, you need to also raise small with some other hands to balance when you have aces. But then when you have to do that, overall you're just making your, you're making your equity worse. And then overall you just converge on the fact that it's better to just go all in. So for the short term, it could be possible that the, the best strategy is go all in with everything else but raise small with aces. But people will catch on and as a Nash equilibrium strategy, everyone converges to just raising all in all the time. Yeah, good question. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's fine, yeah. So, I mean, uh, so, uh, I mean, okay, so in this case where they made it 4x and you call in the big blind, then the pot will already be 1880 and you only have 800. So here it's going to be hard to fold. Like even if you have, even if you have no pair on the flop, chances are they'll also have no pair and just your odds are too good with two cards to come that you'll still most likely have to call. But I mean in this case when you're calling this, the small raise with 4-3 suited, definitely you can fold a lot of flops with 4 high if you just have 4 high. Yeah. Yeah, so you know you can definitely fold when you just call. The point of just calling is you might be able to fold. Right? If you knew you couldn't fold, then you might as well just go all in as soon as possible to give your opponent the, as little information as possible. Yeah. Okay, good. So I want to do a hand where we do a very in-depth analysis of our opponent's range because I want to show you, I mean, this, is, this looks intimidating, but I want to show you at a high level how you basically think about poker hands. So, okay, so this is from a cash game instead of a tournament, but it doesn't really matter. So. The cutoff raises to six dollars, and we call on the button with eight seven of clubs. And in general, we're not so this was this is an implied odds call basically. We're in position, and even though our equity against this range is definitely not enough to call with eight high, but we can win a big pot when we hit a flush or a straight. So we call. The big blind also calls. Yeah, another factor of why we call here is because there's a lot of we have a lot of big blinds, right? We have 
a hundred big blinds. Like say if our stack, we started out with $40, then calling here would be basically lighting money on fire um, because you're not gonna win that much when you hit your straight or flush, right? So we're calling here because it's, we're in position, our hand has very good implied odds, and it's a very deep stacked. There's a hundred big blinds for each player. Okay, the big blind also calls. So, okay, so the they continue the cutoff continuation bets. Okay, we call. Um, you know, we could consider we could consider raising, but basically we have a medium strength hand. By raising, we're not going to get that many worse hands to call, and we're going to fold out um, all the worse hands. So, so we just call. Okay, the big blind folds. Okay, the turn is the queen of clubs, and he bets thirty. And okay, so we can we can uh, analyze this a bit, but I'm going to analyze this all at the end. So what should we do here when he bets thirty? So we definitely don't want to fold with our pair and straight draw and flush draw. So we're either raising or calling. So the benefits of calling is we get to see the river for sure instead of having to fold to his turn three bet all in. So you know, so let's say if we raise to seventy and he goes all in. If you do the calculation of how many outs we have, we won't have press, we won't have enough odds to call. So, so the problem with raising is it he can go all in, and then we would have to fold our draw, even though we have a very good draw. The benefits of raising, though, is it can get him to fold better hands like pocket jacks. Like if he has pocket jacks, he's probably not not continuing when we when we call his flop bet and raise the turn. Um, and we can bet the river and win a bigger pot when we hit when we hit our hand. So, I mean, so so let's just say we call. So I think raising is okay. I don't think raising is terrible, but I, I slightly prefer calling. Um, yeah, with a draw that can't win at showdown, like nine five of clubs, I would prefer raising because my pair of eights can't win the showdown for me, so I need to bluff. And also with a draw that's better than our draw, let's say we had ace jack of clubs, that's that's the nut flush draw, and it's also there's an over card, and also there's more straight outs, right? It, with ace jack, we can river a nine or a king to give us a straight. Whereas with an eight, we can only river a nine to give us a straight. And even worse, when the nine comes, our straight isn't even that good, right? W when the nine comes, we're losing to just a jack, because because we have six through ten, and they have eight through queen if they have a jack. So, okay. Anyways, so we call. Okay, he checks the river. Okay, and we bluff the river, okay? And the thing I want to analyze is this bluff. And I want to use all the information that we have about this hand, about the fact that he raised preflop, he bet the flop, he bet the turn, and he checked the river, right? We have four pieces of information when analyzing his hand. And I want to do a precise calculation of whether this bluff is profitable. And I want to show you that you can do such a calculation. And this also sort of shows you why being in position is so good, right? Since we're in position, we knew that he checked the river. So we have four pieces of inf information when figuring out what hand he has. Whereas if we were out of position, this hand, if we were the big blind, we wouldn't have known that he would have checked the river. So we only have three pieces of information when deciding whether to bluff. So, okay. So yeah, so we might have some chance of winning without bluffing since we have a pair of eights. But there's a lot of higher cards on the board now. The, the pair of eights that looked decent on the flop is a lot worse when the queen and an ace comes. And the pot is big, right? Money went in the flop on money went into the pot on both the flop and the turn. So our opponent could even fold a ten or a queen or even a weak ace if we bet seventy into the pot. And the ace is always a scary card. So yeah, so we know that he checked. So okay, so we're gonna analyze bluffing. And we're gonna basically okay, so what he actually did doesn't matter. So we're gonna use all the pieces of information we have to figure out what hands he could potentially have and eliminate them as we get more information, right? So pre-flop, when he raises, what's the information we have? We just know he probably has like the best 30% of hands or something or whatever we think is, right? So we don't have much information yet. We just know he has one of the hands in the top 30% of hands. Okay, okay, so now he bets the flop. Okay, the fact, the fact that he bets the flop against two players, this could just be a continuation bet, but it still gives us a lot of information about his hand. So I'm gonna start writing them down. Okay, so let's first review the factors of why he would continuation bet, why he won't. 
I'll just put them up here. Um, okay, so why do you want a continuation bet? Your hand is good enough that it beats, you want to get them to call with the worst hand, right? So you want to bet because you want to get them to call it with the worst hand, or your showdown value is poor, so by checking you're not going to win, but you have some equity or you have some backdoor chances to hit some hand, and you're out of position and you can't see a free turn by checking, and you have few enough opponents that you can get them to both fold, incentives against continuation betting, your hand is so dominant that you need to give him a turn to hope that he improves. Uh, incentives against continuation betting, you have decent showdown value, you have zero equity. If you have zero equity because your hand's so terrible, you can just check and fold. If you're in position, you sometimes don't want a continuation bet so that they can't check raise you, and or there's too many people in the pot. So I wanted to briefly review when do continuation bet. So let's go back to the situation. So based on my review of when you think you would continuation bet, let's let's try to list off some hands that he could have here. Okay, so his hand needs to be in the top 30% of hands preflop, right? Because he raised preflop, and he needs to want a continuation bet this flop. So, of course, our analysis won't be perfect because our opponent could play irrationally. But let's assume he plays somewhat rationally, or assume he at least takes this class. And so, okay, so put up your hand if you have a hand that you think it makes sense that he could have at this point. And I'm going to write them on the board. So, one hand or a range of hands that he could have. So, Jack 10. Jack 10, okay. Sorry about that. Um, good. Okay, so Jack 10. So basically top 10, right? Good. So, okay, so let's say all top pairs I can, right? Jack 10 is good enough to raise preflop from that position, and it's a good hand on this flop. Okay, good. Someone else say a hand. Uh, yep. Yeah. Jack 9. Jack 9, very good. So, Jack 9. So, Jack 9. Uh, so, this is a straight draw. Okay, now, now jack nine, jack nine offsuit raising from the cutoff is some people will do it. It's definitely not everyone will do it. So, so you should keep in mind the fact that jack nine m more likely he's only going to have jack nine suited. Okay, and he, he could have jack nine offsuit, but it's less likely. But the point is, if you can eliminate jack nine offsuit, that actually decreases the chances of jack nine by a lot relative to jack ten. Because if you think about how many combinations of jack nine there are, in total there's 16, and four of them are suited, and 12 of them are non-suited. Okay, so if he only plays jack nine suited and not jack nine offsuit, then he can only have a quarter as many combinations of jack nine, and it's a quarter as likely. Okay, so that's a good thing to keep in mind. So let's assume that, okay, let's put a suited here. Let's assume that he's not gonna raise jack nine offsuit. Um, yeah. Suited over cards. Good, suited over cards. Um, Good. So over cards, um, that seems reasonable because you can, uh, yeah, be because you can, you have two over cards, and if they're suited, then you have a backdoor flush. You could, you probably have a backdoor flush draw. Okay, good. Um, what else? Nuts. Nuts. Okay, good. So really good hands, right? So, so pocket tens, pocket eights, pocket sixes, ten eight, eight six. I mean, okay, so. Yeah, nine, seven. So, okay, so we should put suited on the ones that we think he's only raising preflop if they're suited, right? So nine, seven, nine, seven off suit, a bit sketchy. So let's put nine, seven suited, 10, eight, 10, eight off, a bit sketchy. So let's put suited on all of these. Let's assume he only raises these if they're suited preflop. Um, 10, six suited, let's not even put it. I think even 10, six suited is sketchy to raise preflop. Yeah. Okay, uh, nines, I'm gonna assume he calls with nines. Uh, we can. Um, yeah, so, I mean, we can do whatever analysis we want. I had an analysis prehand. If you want, I had an analysis um, beforehand. So, okay, I'm going to say he probably, he probably doesn't think nines is good enough to, to bet against two players. And with nines, he has decent equity by checking. So let's assume he doesn't have nines. Okay, so good. So this is, this is basically it. Um, so let me see my list. What else did I have? Oh, we're, we're, missing, so, we're missing a class of hands. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, but he, he, uh, I'm saying he probably w wouldn't have raised 9-7 offsuit preflop from the cutoff. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we're just missing. Yeah, exactly. Okay, that's the class of hands we're missing. So over pair. <coughs> okay, so jacks, pair of jacks, pair of aces. Okay. Uh, 
K, so that that's all the ones I had on. That's pretty much all the ones I had on my list. So. Okay, so I'm I'm gonna write. Okay, so I'm gonna write all the ones I had on my list down. So. Okay, so aces, kings, queens, jacks. Okay. Ace ten. I'm uh, sorry, king ten. Uh, okay, let, let, let's not give him that many tens. Let's just say he has ace ten, king ten. Okay, uh, ten eight suited, eight six suited, pocket eights, pocket sixes. Okay, pocket tens, nine seven, king ten. So this is going to be a long list of hands. Nine ten nine suited. Okay, so I mean, so some of them we're not that sure, right? So this is not a precise calculation, but it's good. It's a good exercise to think through all the possibilities. It, it's actually a really good exercise because it makes you realize all the possible things that could happen. So, okay, now let's do, do the others. So these are basically his good hands. The hands I wrote here are basically his good hands. Over pairs, strong top pairs, two pair and uh, three of a kind. I'm going to put these in brackets because I feel like some players with pocket tens or nine seven, they would choose to slow play on a flop like this. They would think their hand is so good that they're going to check to hope that we hit the turn because their hand is already so good. So they might not necessarily bet pocket tens and nine seven. Um, they're a lot more likely to bet eights and sixes because with eights and sixes, we can still have a pair of tens. But with tens, he betting might not be that good because we it's really unlikely for us to also have a top pair of tens if he has pocket tens. So he might not bet these and. Uh, King 10 and 10 9, I put in brackets because he might not think they're good enough to bet, but um, we'll put it there. Okay, so these are the hands that he basically bets for value on the flop, let's say. So uh, you, you might disagree in a few small spots, but let's just assume it's this for the analysis. Okay, the hands that he, can you see here? Yeah, okay. The hands that he bluffs, so, okay, let's say ace king suited, uh, king queen suited, ace queen suited. Ace jack suited, king jack suited. Okay, um, queen jack. I'm gonna write that he he bets with queen jack even if it's not suited. Queen jack is significantly better than all those other hands because queen jack can hit a nine to get a straight. Okay, so queen jack. I'm gonna assume it doesn't even have to be suited. Uh, okay, so jack nine suited. Jack nine has to be suited because it needs to be suited pre flop for him to have it. Queen nine suited, uh, so I'll put this together. Jack nine suited, queen nine suited, uh, king nine, ace nine. So there's a few others he might bluff. Ace seven, those all have some kind of have some kind of straight draws. Ace seven, ace six. I mean, so okay. So I'll just write a bunch of stuff on the board. So let's say this is a, about the list. Okay. Okay. Okay, yeah, so, so this is sort of, uh, I should have put this up earlier. So, so this is sort of the five classes of hands that I, I would consider he has. And so the hands that, he are, that are too strong that he checks or traps with, and then the pretty strong hands that he value bets, then the hands of medium strength that he checks, and then the hands that are bad but still have some outs that he bluffs, and then the hands that are complete garbage that he just gives up with. Okay, so I sort of consider he, him to have one of these five classes, and since he bet, we can eliminate three of those classes. We know that he doesn't, he's not, tr he's, his hand isn't so good that he's trapping. And we know that he doesn't have a medium strength hand. And we know that he doesn't have complete garbage. Okay, so we know that he's basically in one of these two buckets. And I sort of wrote them down here. Okay, so now we look at the turn and we can eliminate these, right? He bets $30 on the turn. So why would he bet $30 on the turn? So either he bet a good hand on the flop and his hand is still good on the turn, so he's betting again to get more money from us. Or he bluffed a speculative hand on the flop and now the queen helped him. It either made his hand or it improved his draw. Or he just decided to bluff because the queen is an overcard and he thought it's scary. So, so one of those reasons. So we can go through these hands and consider whether he would whether he would bet when the queen on the turn comes. Okay, so we can eliminate some hands because they're no longer, they're no longer as good. Okay, so, okay, so let's sort of go through the list. Um, okay, so these were great hands on the flop and they're still great hands on the turn. 
Same with these. Um, these definitely wouldn't bet the turn. They're definitely no longer good hands once the turn comes. So we're gonna eliminate, we, we're gonna eliminate king 10 and 10, nine. They're definitely not good enough on the turn for him to bet for value and also not bad enough for him to bluff on the turn. So we'll eliminate these. Similarly, ace 10, um, jacks, I can see him betting, but uh, let's eliminate it. Uh, I, th I eliminated it, whatever, it doesn't matter. But so we eliminate some of these, right? We eliminate the lower end of these that the queen doesn't help. And for these, which of these will he still? So this jack nine, he'll definitely bet because he just made, made the best hand with jack nine. Queen nine, he would bet. Queen jack, he, he would bet um, because they hit a queen. So the, all the nine hands improve, right? Because now he has, before if you had a nine, you needed to hit a seven to get a straight, but now you can hit a seven or a jack to hit a straight. So all of these he would still bet. Um, a seven basically just didn't help at all, so we can cross that off. A six we can cross off. But the queen pretty much helps all of these hands, so we can keep all of them. Okay, so we didn't eliminate too much there. Okay. So now he checks the river. So let's assume that he's not checking to try to trap us. Um, it doesn't seem like a good spot for him because he's already shown plenty of aggression, so he's not going to disguise much by checking. And the ace is not a good card for our range, so it's not likely that we'll bet when he checks. And the pot's already so big, so, you know, if he wants to trap, it's usually because the pot isn't that big. And if you can get in a check raise, you can get, win a lot more money than if you just bet. But the pot's already so big relative to our stack size that just by betting, like, a big percent of the pot, he can already get a lot of money. So let's assume he can't have a, an amazing hand, but we just have a pair of eights. He could easily still have a hand that's beating us, and we'll call our potential bluff. So... Uh, so the ace is because it's not the, like we called the flop and we called the turn, right? So, I mean, if we had a hand like ace king or ace queen, we're more likely to bluff raise on the flop because when we call the flop, it means we sort of hit a piece of the flop. So the ace is a better card for his range in some sense than our range because it's more likely he's bluffing than we're bluffing. So, uh, so it's more likely he has an ace than we do. Okay. Okay, so now let's... So now let's cross out the hands that are so good that can still bet the river. Okay, so someone tell me which of these hands would bet the river. Um, or which of these hands obviously would still bet the river, assuming he's not, assuming he's not slow playing, assuming he's not trapping us. 9-7, that's still a great hand, right? So let's, let's assume he can't have 9-7. Okay, so help me here. What else, what else is too good a hand to check the river to us? Okay, so uh, put, up your, put up your hand. Uh, yeah. Yeah, pocket eight's good. Uh, pocket six is good. Um, yeah. Pocket ten is good. Okay. Uh, yeah. Huh? Yeah. Pocket queen's good. Um, pocket eights is good. Okay. Okay, good. So ace, queen, king, jack, uh, jack nine. Okay. So I think I think that's about it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, okay, I, I, sure, we can put in queen 10. I sort of assumed he might not bet the flop with queen 10. Um, we can write it down. Uh, let's, yeah. Jack 9 has still a pretty good straight. Jack 9 has the second best straight. Yeah, um, okay, let's put down, we can put down queen 10. Um, if he bet, I mean, it's sort of in brackets because I don't think Queen 10 bets the flop for sure. And I don't think, uh, I guess they probably, and I also don't think he necessarily can have, uh, can have King 10 offsuits because of free flop. So, okay, let's give him some combinations. Okay, so we're, we're going to count exact combinations here and we'll give him some combinations of Queen 10. Okay, hopefully that makes you happy. Okay. Um, okay, so we're going to count the exact combinations of all these hands remaining that he could have. Okay. And so, okay, so I'm glad we have the queen 10 here because, also because for that one we'll have some, we'll have partial combinations. Okay, so pocket kings, how many combinations are there that he can have? Um, so we want to count all the ways he can have two kings, right? So the number of combinations is six because there's four kings out there and 
there's six ways to choose two things from each four things. Okay? So there's six. Um, okay, ten eight suited, how many combinations are there? Uh, two, right? Because you can't have ten eight of clubs and you can't have ten eight of hearts. So there's two here. Okay, eight six suited, how many combinations are there? No, not two. There's only there's only one. He has to have eight six of spades, right? Because he can't have the eight of clubs because we have the eight of clubs. So, okay, good. Okay, so there's one. Okay, um, we'll get to queen 10 after. Okay, so ace king suited, how many combinations does he have? Three, okay, good. King queen suited, how many combinations does he have? Three, okay. Uh, ace jack suited, three. Queen, queen jack, we gave him all the combinations. So how many combinations of queen jack are there? 12, good. Okay, queen nine suited, how many combinations are there? Queen nine suited, uh, there's three, I guess, right? Because there's a queen. So, queen jack, three, 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 uh, queen jack, 12, good. Um, actually, for, for, for king queen, you could argue that there's only two. You could argue that, yeah, for king queen, you can argue you can argue that with king queen of spades, he might not have bet the flop because king queen of spades doesn't have a backdoor flush draw on the flop. So let's assume it's only two. Okay. Um, okay. King nine. How many combinations are there? There's. I guess there's a lot. Um, I guess there's. Yeah, I guess there's sixteen. Um, okay. Ace nine. How many combinations are there? I guess there's twelve. Okay, so, okay, now for queen 10, how many actual combinations, okay, let's first assume it's queen 10 not suited. Okay, queen 10 not suited, how many combinations are there? There would be, there would be nine. Okay, so there would be nine and three of them would be suited, right? And so, but he might not raise queen 10 offsuit preflop and he might not bet queen 10 on the flop. So instead of giving him nine to approximate the fact that he might not raise and might not bet, let's give him like four of those nine, or let's give him five of those nine. Okay, so let's just say it's five. Okay, so now, now we got it. So okay, now that we know all the combinations, we look at which of them would call or bluff. Okay, so, okay, so let's, so there's basically three cases. So there's um, call, okay so, so, okay, so hang on, lose. Okay, so we, we're, we're blocking $70, right? So if he calls, if he calls, we lose $70. Now, the other cases, we, um, actually, no, I shouldn't write it like this. Okay, the first case is he'll call, they call, they call, okay. Two is they fold a better hand. And three is they fold the worst hand. Okay, they're never gonna call us with the worst hand, right? So there's basically three cases. Okay, there's three cases. Th three is, okay, so let's assume that they call if they have a pair of aces or better. Okay, I think that's about a reasonable assumption. They call if they have, about a, they have a pair of aces or better. Okay, so now we wanna add up the combinations and see how many combinations of each hand, each, uh, how many combinations of each there are. So, okay. Now let's do the easy one. How often do they fold the worst hand when we bet? How many worst hands are there are in total than ours? So there's just king nine, right? There's, so there's 16 combinations. But so basically with king nine, whether we bluff or not doesn't matter. Because if we bluff, if we bluff, we, we win because he's going to fold king nine. And if we don't bluff, we still win because king nine is behind us. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, why is it eight, six, and six? Uh, so, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Okay, so, so no, because, because here we're sort of thinking of all the combinations. So, like, king of spades, nine of spades. King of spades, nine of hearts. King of spades, nine of diamonds. King of spades, nine of clubs. And then king of, king of clubs, nine of, so there's, there's actually, you don't divide by two. Yeah, the order doesn't matter, but the way I counted it here does not take that into account. 
So you're good. Okay, how many of these hands do they call with? Do they call with? Assuming their strategy is to is to call with a pair of ace, pair of aces or better. So so we add it up, right? So this will call. Ten eight suited will call. Eight six suited will call. Queen ten will call. That's eight <coughs> combinations, right? That's eight combinations. Um, ace king suited. There's three will call. Yeah. So okay. Yeah. Okay. So let <laughs> me do this addition. So it's two plus one plus five plus three. That's uh, 11. Ace jack, that's 14. And ace nine, that's 12. So, so it's 26. OK? Is that right? Let me put a box around the ones I've already added. OK. So now the remaining hands, now the remaining hands is there's six combinations of pocket kings and two combinations of king queen. 12, so that's uh, 20 plus 3, so 23. Okay, so, all right, okay, so if we want to do, okay, so now, now we do, now we do our analysis. Um, okay, so, okay, so this is a bit different than what I have on the slides because, because queen 10 is in here and I didn't have queen 10 on the, on the slides, but. So basically, so if we, right, so if we check, right, if we check, what's our equity? If we check, right, so we're going to compare our equity from bluffing versus checking. So if we check, how, how much, how many dollars do we win? If we check, our, our chances of winning is 16 over 26 plus 23 plus 16, right? times 107, which is what's in the pot, right? This makes sense. Our chances of winning from checking is this, and uh, and and we multiply by the pot. Okay. Now, if we bluff, the chances that he calls is 26 over um, 26 over 26 plus 23 plus 16 times. Uh, and we lose seventy dollars, right? So yeah, so we lose seventy dollars, and the uh, and in the other case, it's um, it's thirty nine over. Okay, I should just figure out what the sum is. Uh, Forty two, sixty five, six thirty nine over sixty five times one oh seven. Okay, so I think this is probably. It's probably very close. I actually don't know the, what which one's better for this ca for this precise calculation, um, because when I did it, I did a slightly different. I had slightly different numbers. So someone can do it, and you, you can calculate. But basically, the point is, you can do this combinatorial analysis and actually calculate which is the better decision. So obviously, you can't do this at the tables, right? Obviously, it's crazy to do this at the tables. Um, it took us like t 15 minutes to do it, but. If you're analyzing hands and you want to study your own play and get better, this is precisely what you do when you're trying to figure out whether a river spot is good or not, right? So, um, and all of your calculations won't be exactly precise because you might, you know, you think they fold ace jack, but they actually call ace jack or whatever. But this is definitely a good exercise to go through to consider what they could have. Okay, so I'm going to take a five minute break and then I'm going to show you some hands from a tournament I played to finish off the class.